is Demon Stiff with Austin Warrior Arts, Kama Historical African Martial Arts Association. I got my ace up in here. There we go. Three. All right, so we're going to uh, demonstrate uh, thrusting techniques, how to set up a thrust in mathematics stick fighting, all right? So we're going to start off with our two opening horizontal cuts to the side of the head, and we're going to create a flow with this, all right? So we start off here. Two, initiate the strike. One, two. Now I'm going to return. So we're just going to build the flow. Just build the flow, move around a little bit, change the, uh, the directions of the strikes. Right. Okay. So we're on that beat, that one, two beat now, okay? So we're going to alter that second strike and turn it into a thrust. So I come into my open, uh, I'll do uh, my cut from the side here. One, and I'm going to chamber in close to me. And I'm already prepared for this backhand thrust. So we're just going to show and demonstrate that. I'll go to the other side as well. My backhand cut, and I'm chambered for that thrust. Sure, go ahead and do the same thing. I'm here. He's ready for the thrust. Other side. He's ready for the thrust. Okay, we'll do this in the flow now, okay? We're just going to show the thrust. Go ahead. So, one. I'm going to let him work it out. And backhand. Cool. Here I come in. One. And backhand. Two. All right. Now let's go ahead and do a little bit of back and forth. You can just like the thrust now, okay? He'll come in, he gives me one, two, and then the other. Good. Okay, one, and then here. Good, then we keep it going. Let's go one for one. One, two, yeah. Good. One, two, one, two, okay. So, again, if you want to integrate thrusting, into your Mathrag or North African sword play, this is a great way. Bait the parry, open the line for the thrust. And of course, always remember your exit strategy is as important as your, your attack. Peace. Good evening, folks. Welcome to Defamate Discussion. This is episode 409, and tonight we're going to be looking at African martial arts as well as Latin arts and the fusion there and how they compare and contrast to FMA. So if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button. If you have questions, please put them on the right-hand side, and I will definitely get them. So without further ado, we are bringing our guest, Damone, on, and here he is. Hey, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. How are you doing? Good. I appreciate you coming on doing this. Um, this is well, well overdue. Um, I know we've been in contact for some time. Probably, gosh, it's got to be at least over a year or so about getting you on. And I'm just happy that we were able to you know, finally make it happen. You know? Yeah, me too. I know uh, I appreciate you uh, being patient with me. It's almost like herding cats sometimes. Like I'm kind of <laughs> in and out and I'm glad we were able to actually sit down and make it happen now. Yeah, yeah. I know you're busy. You got stuff going on. But, hey, it sounds like it's all good stuff. So, you know, but, uh, yeah. So before we, you know, we get into the whole the African and Latin arts there and all that, what was your initial martial arts background before you segue into those? Okay. So, okay, that's a great question. It's a very circular question as well. But the, the quick answer is, as a kid, um, I started off with two two versions. My first version was uh, Shaw Brothers Rue. That was my, my starting starting point early on, uh, just like watching movies and imitating what I saw. Um, as I got a little older, I uh, started training uh, like a, first in Florida, uh, an Okinawan style of karate. And then at 13, I had a chance to, opportunity to train in Okinawa with uh, a short and root system under Grandmaster Fusei Kisei. Um, from there, I started to uh, get that Miyamoto Musashi, Bruce Lee bug. Yeah. And started yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> started like looking yeah. into, um, you know, different systems. Uh, at the time, uh, martial arts was a very, like it was, for me, it, it was not just something that my parents put me in to like do for like discipline or for whatever else. It was like um, when I mentioned earlier about, you know, 
watching movies and then kind of imitating and reenacting some of that stuff. Uh, th that was part of like my, um, I mean, it was more than just like, this is a, a pastime or activity that I'm doing. This was like, you know, developing into like an identity and into a way of life in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, I had a point to that. I'm getting old, so I tend to like ramble and forget things. No, it's okay. It's so, okay. It's, it's it'll fine. Start, start <laughs> back and come back into me. But uh, yeah, so I, I think that at the time um, when I was training, formally training, uh, I started to feel a little, uh, feel a little limited with what I was learning. Mm -hmm. And um, when I saw and started to to come across these different uh, ways of these different approaches to martial arts from different cultures within East Asia and within, you know, Southeast Asia as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it really, it really captivated my attention. So I started to want to like expand and, mm -hmm. you know, broaden my horizons. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you, when you go into the JKD world, particularly if you're under the Anasano lineage, direct or indirect, you're getting exposed to all these different arts, you know what I mean? And, um, and at first, you know, you don't realize it. I didn't realize it. You, you know what I mean? But now looking back, it's like, wow, you know what I mean? And, uh, and so you, like, you think you're walking to just JKD and it's, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something else. Yeah. Um, I, it was funny is like, and it will, as, as we have this conversation, it, it's funny. Like the, um, I was not, I was, in, I was, really focused in, in, in Shoranu Karate. And then I got to that point where I was like, I wanted, to, it felt like limiting to me. And then I find myself now um, looking back at some of the, like uh, what's kind of like some of the older, um, older videos. And just kind of like looking back at, at the, at Okinawan Karate and, and coming to a different understanding of like, Oh, the, what I'm doing now, in some regards, um, is is somewhat similar. Maybe not from a very overt and technical standpoint, but just kind of how um, the art developed. Um, mm -hmm. And we're talking about things like capoeira and stuff. We'll see how um, what shaped the art. The there there are these pressures that kind of create um, or shape the way we receive arts. And just seeing that there was a similar similar pressures that happened with uh, karate and capoeira to kind of shape and mold it to what it is today. It, it, it's, it's really, it's an interesting full circle for me. That is, that is interesting. I mean, yeah, and especially when you look at a traditional art as opposed to capoeira, you know. Um, we got a, hey, Errol, how you doing? Um, and so, uh, okay, what, I guess, you know, what led you was it African martial arts first or Latin martial arts first? So I don't I don't draw a distinction between the okay. two things. I'm looking at when when I'm looking at the arts that are practiced in in uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, North America, we're looking at an extension of of, of African culture. Uh, it, so I'll refer to it as a diaspora. Um, so. Uh, pretty much where you find people of African descent that uh, made that their ancestors made that 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 cross uh, that transatlantic crossing, um, they brought with them uh, a lot of what was with them in their homelands, and even in places where we feel that that stuff was completely lost. And that's where I was at when I was younger. I thought mm -hmm. that everything that we had was completely lost. Um, there were areas where these things survived. And of course they evolved um, differently depending on what those environmental, social, uh, colonial pressures that they encountered, but they still are, in my opinion, rooted in these traditions from West and Central Africa. You know, if, you know what I find fascinating is, is that, you know, when you, when you refer to coming over the, you know, transatlantic and all that. So do you think a lot of them were well seasoned martial artists or were they or was it try what they what they did in a particular tribe this this is why i really dig into because I, I just find it so fascinating yeah so the 
with the amount, well, let's start like this. When we look at fighting arts in the African diaspora, um, there are like over easily over 20 that you can count. Okay. And they contain um, uh, striking arts using the whole body, whether that's punching, kicking, or striking with other parts of the body, like the head, elbow, and knee. Uh, you find these striking arts, you find grappling arts, and then you find uh, weapons arts, whether that's mm -hmm. using sticks or using machetes. Um, what we're learning, or what we're what it what it appears to be the case, is that many people that one the martial tradition is very strong um that was really strong in these areas and what it looks like is that many people that were brought over during the slave trade um were actually captured you know on battlefields and they brought that those, those that skill set with them okay interesting uh, okay yeah, there's a there's a really interesting book uh, by uh, Carlos uh, Marcia that talks about it's it's called it's it's, it's basically on slave and insurrections in Brazil and in Cuba, and he discusses how in what we what we refer to as slave insurrections, the participants of these insurrections were actually using traditional um, African methods to muster armies, to prepare armies, and strategies and tactics that they would use in, in, in their homelands. And so these theaters, these insurrections, these theaters of war, as they saw them, mm. were an extension of what they were doing and how they fought in their own homelands. Um, so I would say most definitely this, it was, and, and you know, and when we're talking about the people that were coming over, we're not just talking, I mean, of course, we're talking about specific. Uh, we're talking about tribes, mm -hmm. but we're also talking yeah. about um, kingdoms and nation states as well. Um, it, you know, it's just um, uh, when I think about it, the type of the reason why people were brought over to work in, you know, in essence, tropical ag do tropical agriculture, animal husbandry, uh, blacksmithing. These were skills that they already possessed in their native lands. Um, and it made it easier for them to work in these environments because they were used to that type of agriculture, that type of animal husbandry, or working with, with metals and things of that nature. So uh wow. yeah, I believe it definitely these were they were they were um many were well-trained mm. fighters, many of them um depending on the area, they could um they could ride horses. Yeah. Uh, they could use guns. Um, it just depends on which part of the continent they were captured and which battlefield they were captured on. Um, during the um, the Malay uh, up slave uprising in Brazil, the Malay who were a a, a Muslim population that were like uh, descendants of like Hausa, Nupe, um, people from West Africa. Maybe some other groups. They got the name Malay because they were Muslim, and Malay was like a, a way of saying Mali, which was a which was a a, a very powerful Islamic uh, country kingdom. I should say kingdom empire in West Africa. But the um, the Malay slave insurrection, they were actually using Quranic script to communicate, uh, you know, details of their of their um, their campaigns. Wow. And so yeah. In many cases, you're talking, you're dealing with a, a well-trained, um, a well-trained, you know, uh, a body of people who, you know, yeah, brought those skills with them, and in some cases, were able to like pass them on. Yeah, see, I don't think that's, you know, it's so interesting. I don't know, if, I don't think that's widely known. You know, I don't think that's widely, widely known. Like I'm telling you right now, I was just talking to you tonight. I did, had no degree of that. Um, in that in you know that they actually in these incredible skill sets when so regardless of the geographic area where they were captured in regards of where they went whether it was the you know united states uh south central america south america whatever i mean so these skill sets regardless of where they were going they, they were they were finding themselves in, in all these areas um wow wow um that is so interesting um when so 
you I mean, besides doubling into these arts, I mean, you <clears throat> you must have did like some definitely research historically there, over there and stuff like that, you know, which is incredible. Obviously, it shows the way you're explaining things. Um, just fascinating. Wow. Um, so I know you understand. You said you kind of lump it into one because basically, even though it's Latin, there's obviously you're saying there was the African influence in there and, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Like they, they, um, yeah, it's when you look at these arts, it's, it's, it's a, it's much, it's much like myself, right? Mm. Like I'm a byproduct of, of, you know, people of African descent being brought over to this part of the world. Um, and my worldview is shaped by that reality and this new reality that I'm in. So of course, like um, um, culture, language, religion, cuisine, mm. medicine, you may, so medicine, for example, like herbal knowledge, right? So there are certain plants that grow in certain areas and other plants that don't grow, that grow in certain areas. So if you have a body of knowledge that's based off of your homeland and you get taken from your homeland, and you find yourself in a new place, um, you still have the skills and the knowledge of as an herbalist, so you may not find the same plants, you know, in your new place, but you find a way to adapt what's there okay. to your needs. And that's exactly what happened with these arts is they may have had like one function mm. or function in a particular way in their in their particular cultures um, at one time, but being brought over, it introduced this new stimuli to, to their, to their, their culture. And it's like, it, it had to like adapt and adjust, you know, based off of that. So like, you know, we see a lot of stick fighting um, mm. in Africa on the continent. Um, we see stick fighting also in the African diaspora. And so like the knee jerk reaction is to say, oh, okay, well, you know, you know, most, African weapons fighting is fighting with sticks, right? And so then we look at a, a bladed art like tear machete, and it's easy to default to say, well, okay, so they weren't using swords, they were using sticks. So it looks like it was a combination of, of African stick fighting, and I'm using quotations, African stick fighting with say like, oh, it's a French speaking colony. So mm -hmm. like you know, French fencing, and then this creates this tear machete. And so that kind of happens, especially when we assume that the people that were enslaved were at a level, um, were at a lower level in compares in comparison to their to their captors, okay. as far as like martial martial skill martial skills and technology and stuff. And in in many cases, as far as like technology, that may have been the case in some in some regards, but it wasn't that it wasn't that these cultures weren't using blades mm. uh swords, knives spears axes it wasn't that these cultures weren't well organized and um and it wasn't that these cultures were easy to to conquer even with guns armors armor and you know whatever so that's that's kind of the like the cultural myth to um that i that i try to combat combat okay. by explaining uh just the the level of resistance that occurred not just in captivity but by these nation states and people on the other side of the continent on the other side of the atlantic as well you know it totally makes sense though that they were organized they had a methodology if you look at carthage i think the romans hell <laughs> i mean yeah, yeah i mean so you're trying to tell me that they didn't have an organized system <laughs> Yeah, you said the c word, so that's gonna get people crazy when, <laughs> when um, whenever it, there are three, there are three controversial topics when it comes to like African history, um, places and people, okay. and that kind of like it gets everybody all riled up. Carthage is one of those things. Okay. The Moors is the other one. The Moors. And Egypt, okay. And the Egyptians is a, is a third thing. It, it usually gets people kind of like uh, riled, riled up because of, um, again, the same the same idea that there's this um, this uh, sharp distinction as you travel north south, um, and uh, these ideas that we all have to kind of combat. So, yeah, yeah, the the um, in 
in, I believe it was in Central Africa, the Battle of mm-hmm. Soyo, they dealt like the, um, and I, I believe it was, and Central Africa is not my strong, strong area, but um, the Portuguese tried to, um, f- you know, fight, tried to invade that area and, were, and they were, you know, defeated. And after which um, their strategy, their their method of interacting with these nations was more like a Game of Thrones. It's like you, you create alliances and friendships, trading mm-hmm. partnerships with certain people. You serve as mercenaries to those people, and then you know you benefit from you know the the fighting because in the slavery is not anything that's new uh, in Africa or in any other place. Um, that was a common way to like replenish um, what you lost. You know, you lost people, you so can regain. That and, gotcha. Right. right. So um, you know the difference is when when it comes to like the ideology behind the slavery and it's just one of the things that makes it different ancient form and that's the same for ancient forms of slavery versus like the you know the the transatlantic slave trade mm. um but yeah no there were some well organized um uh powerful kingdoms even though some of them were at the their their point of a period of decline um when uh in, in the europeans arrived as like traders in essence not as conquerors and that that was a a gradual thing that happened over oh, so, time. oh you're saying initially it was it was trade and then from there kind of yeah yeah so because so the, the idea is that we have like when we think of slavery um is like you know you know europeans coming in and it's like you know just like laying waste and sweeping up and it's taking people and it it was it was more complex than that um okay. and it, initially and I will say, and I'm speaking more like in in broad terms. Mm. There may have been a, attempts at 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 conquest at first, but I think the main thing was, um, it was easier to build relationships as opposed to like you know we're just like this dominant force. Yeah, we're just gonna, gonna come in there and just to hurt you know. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, wow. that's even like it, that's like Islam Islam in in West Africa. Mm. It didn't. It didn't um, enter West Africa through war. It um, it entered West Africa, uh, the Sahel, through uh, trade. It went to North Africa through war, but it it gradually uh, filtered into West Africa because, you know, you had uh, Amazigh people or what they call Berbers mm. that were that were you know crossing the Sahara, connecting. You know uh the kingdoms of the sahel the peoples of the sahel with the mediterranean world and um you know islam was like the was like the religion of um of of uh you know it was it was easy to kind of like establish um trade connections with 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 muslims if you were also muslim and so like you'll find that the royalty uh the nobles would become Muslims and create this connection whereas the people that lived in the the um in the uh the countrysides and in the the towns they still practice uh their traditional beliefs and there was this this synergetic interaction between these two concepts where it wasn't like mm. just this complete obliteration of one thing um and it wasn't like until like the 19th century where um there were these uh um uh Islamic jihads in the area that led to forced conquest of people. Now, mm-hmm. I will say this, uh, just to, to kind of make sure I'm covering my tracks. Now, when there were Muslim leaders that were in in the Sahel, they they did practice uh, practice you know waging war against non-Muslim kingdoms okay. in order for in in order to to procure you know slaves in essence for to replenish their horses. So it's kind of like it's a it's a uh, dirty bit because their power base depended on cavalry, and um, in order to like raise and maintain a large large force of cavalry, you had to trade um, in the Maghreb in the in the West and in North Africa. So people and gold would travel north, and salt and horses and steel and stuff like that will travel south. It's just so interesting. You know what I mean? It's just like his, you know, and just, you know, the amazing 
like through trade, you know what I mean? Like, you know, spread of religion, spread of war tactics, spread, I mean, just, you know, I mean, it was, such, it was a powerful aspect back then, you know, trade, you know, it's just, um, yeah. okay. So again, you look at Bolt and all that, I guess what countries as far as this fusion of Bolt or what styles did you really dive into, I guess? Okay. So my, the short answer is my entry into African martial arts, into all of this was through Capoeira. Okay. Um, yeah, that's my, I usually don't say the answers that fast, but it's, it, it is like the, the entry for me. Okay. Um, and so with, with being exposed to Capoeira, I had to confront, um, quite a few, um, uh, I had to confront a few things or what confront my knowledge of um, history here in uh, the diaspora. Now, um, when I start learning about Capoeira, the very nature of it is like the question is, is, has always been its origin. Mm. And um, there are certain, going back to what I mentioned about certain pressures that kind of like shape the way we receive um, some of these arts. Uh, you know, Capoeira had been has has had a, a long history in Brazil. Um, it was um, uh, at at a certain period of time, it was very antagonistic, um, outlawed, mm -hmm. and um, and then during this period in Brazil's history, there was this uh, desire to like uh, develop a national identity. Um, especially in response to like how Brazil fed in in the world and trying to create this idea of uniqueness for itself. And then with the influx of immigrants and foreign combat sports in Brazil, uh, many, many, there was a, a movement to kind of create Capoeira as a, uh, or, or present or present Capoeira as a um, national sport okay. or combat sport for for brazil um so then with that comes certain again certain pressures of origin so it was important to like couch its origin uniquely in brazil uh so then that's when you get some of the you know when you ask somebody typically when you know well what is capoeira it's like oh capoeira is a is a is a is a is a martial art disguised as a dance mm. created by enslaved africans to hide the fact or disguise the fact that they were training, that they were preparing to fight. And so they added in music and acrobatic flourishes and blah, 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 to create this facade. And so like on surface level, that seems kind of true. It's like, it's, it is acknowledging that there are, that, that the practice, the, the practice, it was created by people that of African descent um, is also acknowledging a very common tap tactic you find for survival in the diaspora, which is to hide something in plain sight, mm. um, to merge it with something that already exists so that it can survive. And, um, you know, yeah, it makes sense. Well, why as a slave owner, why would I want my slaves to know how to fight? Like, you know, yeah, right. of course not. <laughs> right. It, it makes a lot of sense. And it is, from my understanding, it is not correct. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not, not completely correct. At least not for the period of time that we're talking about. Um, yeah. The, Capoeira was never, never, never not known to be a violent activity. It was, it was one of the earliest depictions and descriptions of Capoeira both by a, a German painter named Rugendis. And he described it as a, an act, he described it as best he could. Yeah. And he quite mentioned he mentioned that it was a violent activity that usually resulted, you know, um, in like knives being drawn and 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 these types of conflict happening. Okay, that same kind of image we think of when we think of Capoeira today, like as just kind of like this playful, joyful this dance and music. And can I just ask one question? Why yeah. did Brazil seem to be the central or the or the focal point for Capoeira? I mean. Is it like, in other words, 
when I look at other countries, I'm not saying it's not there. It just seems Brazil is really known and prominent for that. Is there a reason for that? Well, I mean, Brazil has more people of African descent than many African nations. Really? Okay. That's, all right. Okay. Yes. And like the slave trade didn't end. Slavery was abolished in uh, what I think 1888, 1889. That late? So, yes, that late. In Brazil. And so you had an influx of people coming in like that late in history. So like, and that then that is the tricky part with Brazil because it's when you say Brazilian culture, um, a lot of it is heavily influenced by African culture. How could culture. I not? They had the slave trade to the late 1800s. I mean, wow. I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There, there may be somebody there, and, and I want to be specific about slavery ended in, 18, in 1888 or 1889. Mm. It could have been a situation where, but I feel like that the importation of people did not end until, until much later on. Um, uh, I mean, much later on, not as late as 1888 or 1889, mm. but definitely much later than what we experienced in the United States. Um, it could be that the practice still continued into 1888 and 1889, but the importation of people ceased earlier. I'm not 100% sure on the timing of that. Mm. But two of the most prominent um, um, ma uh, mestres of uh, modern capoeira, their teachers were said to be African. Okay. Um, and again that gets tricky is that a is that actually a um were they born there were their parents born there mm. it, it, it could have gone either way but the and it could also refer to their their complexion or their level of admixture as well okay so there there are typically different terms they use to describe you know uh levels of admixture or even like you know where people were born. So, like, if you refer to someone as an African, um, it usually meant that that, that kind of what it says. If you said like Creole, it meant someone who was like born in in um, not in Africa in, in Brazil. Okay. So, um, but yeah, so that's the reason why for Brazil, like, it has a it has a very very reach re reach <laughs> rich and recent uh, connection um with africa yeah um, it's, it's like when you hear about it like i don't hear capoeira from like other countries. i'm not saying it, that's it's not the case and i'm not saying it's not going on there but i mean everybody knows i mean brazil capoeira and uh, i was just wondering yeah. why brazil is opposed to other countries and it totally makes sense you know what you're saying well well there are and just to kind of give respect out to them i'll, I'll say them just a few um um just in a diaspora just to kind of like just to just to kind of paint the picture. Mm. Um, in Brazil, uh, capoeira, jogo do pau, pernada, batuque, uh, punga de maranesa, um, and hookah de pau. These were variants of capoeira that all became like uh, recognized as early forms of capoeira. Okay. And then the Jogo do Pau and Hookah do Pau is like these are stick fighting forms. In, uh, and Makulele um, is a machete work. And that's just in Brazil. In Venezuela, uh, Garote, La Renza, uh, Broma. Garote is stick and machete fighting. Mm. And the other one is uh, empty hand fighting, similar to Capoeira. Um, in Colombia, there are the very various uh, um, studios of of, um, of um, Escolima, okay. uh, machete fencing, um, in Trinidad, Tobago. Uh, there is what we call uh, Kalinda, in Haiti, uh, tier machete, which is machete fencing, tier bois, which is stick fighting, and pingue, which is a form of wrestling. Okay. Um, in Guadalupe, there is um, uh, what is it? Uh, Benadin and Sayo uh, Saye, and I'm I'm butchering it. Valente, and then uh, Le Mayole, which is stick fighting as well. The other two are are um, 
empty hand kind of boxing forms. Um, in Puerto Rico, Juego de, in, in Puerto Rico, um, Coco Ballet, mm. Kalinda, um, in Cuba, uh, Juego de Mani, uh, in Martinique, Damier, Lagia, um, in Granada, Barbados, there's also, uh, in Barbados, they call it Bajan stick licking. In Granada, it's a, a Kalinda, it's a stick fighting form. Mm. Uh, Suriname, there was um, Setu, which is stick fighting. In Curaçao, there was um, uh, Coco Maracatu, which is stick fighting. In the United States, there's evidence of Kalinda, stick fighting. Uh, there's knocking and kicking, which was a, a striking art similar to Capoeira. Um, and 52 hand blocks, which is like a regional, you know, is black vernacular boxing styles. Um, and there's, there's, you know, that's only the ones that I'm remembering just off the top of my head. That's, that's that, a ton. And that's, so that's this. all the ones you just mentioned, those have some shape, way, or form, some African influence. And yeah, most definitely. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're 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 connected to each other in different ways. Um, um, like Damier is very similar to Capoeira. Um, it, the only difference is that the way that it's preserved now in mm -hmm. Damier, all you know, mixed martial art in a sense. And I'm using quotes, but it's just like it contains striking with the whole body, okay. hands, yeah. feet, head, elbow, knees. It contains uh, grappling, throws, and even like you know, continued continued grappling on the ground. Okay. Uh, uh, whereas capoeira has a very very uh, limited form of grappling, and a limited use of the hands. Mm. Uh, but technically, from a technical standpoint, we're, they're still using some of the same types of kicks. And the same types of strikes. And a capoeira does have empty hand strikes. I will say that, okay. um, but it's just kind of one of those things that, again, the the cultural pressures, the cultural aesthetic in these individual communities, mm -hmm. and shaped, you know, how they would, um, how what retained and what didn't retain, or what evolved and how it evolved. Just fascinating, fascinating. Now. All the arts that you mentioned are that are they still active? Are they dying out? Are there active teachers or? Yeah, yeah. So many of them, um, the ones that are named, are um, they're they're still they they are still being practiced. They there was a period of time when they were dying out, mm -hmm. um, and I I do accredit Capoeira's popularity um, and exposure to this like phenomena in the diaspora okay. to like helping to to um keep or i guess to reinvigorate uh some of these other systems but yeah uh, many of them are, st are still still functioning still alive and they're kind of uh, experiencing this resurgence oh, good, um, good. <laughs> and, and many have died out many but it, it's kind of like a it, it's a thing where it's like mm. you know in 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 colombian machete you know over the past I would say like three years, we lost like three, you know, old maestros. And that's like, um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a whole lot of information, a whole lot that's of not, That's leaving, you know, with no yes. air or no, yeah. Folks, if you're watching, if you know of like C letter FMA systems that you know have died, uh, posted in there, I, I just, it's one of the sad things, you know, that some of these arts, they're just, they're going to go. I mean, they're just, there's no mm -hmm. lineage. Like, I know a couple of FMA systems, like Lenata Screamer, for one. Um, I don't know, you know, outside of a, a, a gentleman in New Hampshire, you know what I mean? And maybe a few years, but I think there's going to be a day when a lot of these systems are just going to, and it's um, obviously yeah. very sad uh, in there. Yeah. I got a question for, this is from Tom, and Tom's question was, Columbia Screamer or Stick? versus fma like what i guess similarities differences like have you do you know or wherever i've seen okay that's a great question and that's it's one that's come up a couple of times um 
and I will do my best. I'm not the the most qualified person to answer this, but I will will do my. Well, give me well my I can tell you right now, you're definitely more qualified than anybody here watching. So go ahead. Um, I think that um, I think that I don't think that there is a. Let me see how I should start this. So in Western Central Africa, mm. the, uh, I think it's, for, for me, I think it's a matter of, as the saying goes, uh, similar roots produce similar fruits, mm. right? Okay. You know, and so we're talking about um, cultures that um, use similar tools for war and for everyday work for agriculture. Mm. And... Wow these tools being adopted, you know, again, mentioned using them to, to, to fight and for self-preservation. Uh, so I think that like, in the case of the people that were brought over to Colombia, they had an intimate knowledge from their countries using short blades, short cutting, chopping, slashing blades. Okay. Then incidentally, depending on, on, on what, what, type of uh, work you did as a, as as an enslaved person you had an even more intimate knowledge of using a, a machete mm. for your for your daily your daily task um so i think that the 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 beginnings of that is like this these short tools being kind of common in these cultures and then you add into the element um you know a colonial presence that is either repressing mm. uh these these systems or these people or, or both at the same time um so it's hard to answer like the to answer intelligently like i don't think that like i, I will say i don't think that um that the uh colombian styles come from filipino styles and i don't necessarily think that the colombian styles um on a large on our always influenced by Spanish fencing. So um, as far as like my similarity, what I see as what's similar, it goes back to the use of the tool, right? Mm. One difference though I will say is, and this is kind of from like my 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 maestro okay. and his teacher and the way strikes are given is a little different. So um, let me let me grab some real quick. Sure, sure. I'll show you Awesome. All right. And then, guys, he's going to be showing a bunch of African weapons. So what we got okay. there? This is an e Kakalak. This is a Central African uh, sword made by us here at Street Forge Armory. It's sharp on both ends, right? Look at so, that. So this is a short, a short, a short weapon here, right? Okay. Not very long. Yeah. And so what I notice is one you guys you know that right when you're doing the doing your thing yeah yeah your rip curls, hand, yeah right all right you don't do this right when you're let your fingers go right yeah you want to do that. Control, control right yeah. so my maestros um they actually when they're manipulating and holding the machete you can't really see it with this with this weapon here they'll actually open their hands up and switch their grips into these kinds of like really weird positions. And there's like a Ooh. lot of uh, this finger, finger manipulations. Maybe, or... Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And so what I've noticed is that when the strikes are delivered, like, so you have these, these, these fluid, like big fluid sweeping cuts, right? What they tend to do and what I've noticed is you can see how my hand is kind of open here. Correct. It's like they'll give these types of percussive types of strikes using the fingers to kind of create this oh, like. Call, oh my gosh! Something audience a calibit. Sometimes it's referred to as calibit, in, uh, where you're basically you're keeping the bomb three tight and you're getting that that kind of that. Per, snap yeah. they call it a meteor strike in lameco for instance um i think that's mm -hmm. what you're about it's, it looks similar uh folks yeah. if you're watching and i'm 
totally off base. Uh, please let me know. Um, yeah. And so I think the reason why is it, it, it it's kind of so one concept that we have in our training is is this idea of ma malicia or deception of movement. Right. Okay. And so like you project, you can project large. Right. And then change that 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 stripe to make it come at a different angle. Interesting. And so that, that kind of that kind of. Oh, I guess what in JKD they call like a progressive indirect uh, attack. Progressive indirect attack. Um, yeah. yeah, like when you're going one way and then you you can you can switch the yeah, switch absolutely. the angle yeah. by using the hands. And you notice, and I think uh, uh, Guru Burden Richardson has done a a, a lot of uh, research on uh, Nguni and Zulu stick fighting. Yeah, he's a he teacher. He's done. Oh, that's not what I want. He's done an extreme amount. Uh, Sorry about that. Yeah, he he um, he has, and uh, um, he spoke to me on several times. But he's gone over there a few times, and um, yeah, yeah. But, so I'm pretty sure shown, shown where they they use these 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 motions to kind of like because we know we're thinking drift of drift shots. You're coming here, and yeah. Wait, like he referred to them as drift, uh, or he would as drift shots. Um, Mm -hmm. there but but much to your point it's kind of the single and here it comes and now it's drifting to the leg yeah boom yeah. yes yeah so. so that and and that is one thing that i thought was very interesting at least like mm -hmm. the way that um um my teacher moves i do see the scene the same concepts in like uh the use of angles even though um a little differently it's like there is a um uh there's a uh uh a footwork pattern that you would do like in bikini, like I think they call it estrella, right? Where um you you step and you're like angle yeah, okay, yeah. here. Yeah, boom, back like that, right? Um there is a similar thing that we would do um where we're still working on the idea of this star pattern, mm. but it involves like um it involves using a it's weird because it's like a they use kind of like this, I, I don't know, for lack of a better term, this Aikido style like footwork. I think of this like it's for lack of a better word. It's like we're we're stepping and then we're pivoting and turning. Okay. So like we would um, we would step on an angle, step you know an angle, mm. and then and then step around and, and pivot. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we'll do that on a on a on a star pattern. Um, I think the similarities is like this, this emphasis on, on, um, body positioning mm. for us, um, being able to like, you know, what we would call like, um, in, in the, um, in Central Africa, the way that they were trained, they would call it, uh, in Sangha. Which was a, a dance that 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 prepared the warriors to like dodge attacks, basically okay. like edge and impact weapons. And you kind of see this this kind of this this emphasis on that, like in arts like capoeira, where there's very little blocking at all. Everything is mostly dodging and and blending with the attacks. Mm. But we see it also like in in Colombian machete, where we're doing a lot of level changing, a lot of voiding attacks okay. um, in order to like, um, in order to like, you know, get into a superior position or to make the person miss. Yeah. And um, um, what else? Uh, the rhythm of it, it's uh, reminds me of it, of, of Filipino martial arts as well. What we don't see a lot of, so we do use our hands to like, to like, to like guide, slap and, move things out of the way mm. uh tech strikes and things of that nature um i don't think that it's reached a so i think that and this is just my opinion when talking about these arts they exist within their cultural and within their within their culture and then they're expressed their the fights are expressed within that culture okay. and so like you know fighting is not always it's chaotic, but it's, it, there are also like different levels to like to fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it might be culturally sanctioned. So um, going back to how it's 
performed or how it's expressed um it's expressed within that culture is basically what i'm saying so it's not like the is it, it's, it's not in the same way that we are looking at like say filipino martial arts we're looking at it on a, a cultural level okay. but we're also looking at it as like on a on a just a generic tactical using edge impact weapons you know mm. you know so i don't think some of these arts have gone to that point yet and so with that with that with that um focus it creates a different um refinement in the movements in a sense does that make sense yeah yeah no it does and i know you want to show some weapons which i'm look, so looking forward to tom just made yeah. a question and what tom's question is would love to know which african martial arts he loves to practice also which african blade is the most uh unique and fun for him to play um oh. and then we got a question from brian yeah. right now. do you have a sporting expression of the art you practice so you got three questions <laughs> okay okay cool 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 all right so which martial art do african martial art do i love to practice um my mother art is a uh, capoeira mm. and it uh it gives me hell on many aspects but it also made for me made it possible for me to do um what it is i do um it, it's given me a, a heightened sense of um of uh, range mm. of balance uh my footwork and my this understanding of measure i attribute that really to capoeira like capoeira really like I tell my students, especially ones that come to me to train just like the weapons. Okay. It's like I, I am like, you know, Capoeira is really my superpower. Like it, it is, it it is what for me, it was that it was that aha moment that was then I was able because I, you know, I had trained other systems yeah. uh, before, but I always felt like my footwork um was very like wooden, like I felt very you know, trapped. And it's mm -hmm. not the, it's not like, I'm not saying this is the, the reason of the arts. It it was, you know, we all learn differently and sometimes we get things at different points. And for me, Capoeira was like, you know, boom, it it just, it freed me in a lot of ways. Okay. Uh, so like uh, doing Capoeira, like I have to always give respect because it, it is, I think what really has elevated me as a martial artist and a fighter. Um, I do also, um, I enjoy um, uh, Colombian machete. Um, again, it has a lot of the same kind of aspects that you see in Capoeira as far as like how dynamic it is, mm. these changing levels, the sense of like um, malicia and treachery, because we use the same term in Capoeira for, um, for, you know, how we set traps and things of that nature. Uh, Colombian machete is very, very like elegant. Um, I like the way you know it. I like the way it feels to uh, when I when I'm doing that. Um, that's 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 probably like it's not my only favorites. For those of you um, kind of top two, so to speak. Okay. No, and then and then like a, a, a more experimental um, aspect is um, using like uh, the Takoba Tuareg sword, um, and that is kind of like a brainchild of mine, just kind of like. Uh, getting to like look at taking my knowledge as a martial artist mm. and then looking at like uh, traditional sword dances from the uh, the Keltamashek people in uh, in the Sahel and then kind of like you know seeing what those what what fencing principles are preserved within the dances and that's I enjoy doing that as well okay his second part was which African blade is the most unique and fun for him to play with? I think I'm most known for the uh, Chotel. Um, the Chotel is a is a uh, wild blade. Um, it's a if you would imagine like a uh, Shamshir. And actually, why am I trying to describe it? I yeah, think. let's. Get, <laughs> and then we'll get to Brian's question. That's not what I wanted to do. How did that happen? uh all right folks um i'm sure which is a glitch on his part but um yeah let's see we get him back in 
I'm guessing something that occurred when he left to go get his blades. But uh, I'm going to send him a message and just tell him to jump back on with the same link. Okay. Uh, jump back in. Ah, and he's there. All right. That was super weird. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, I was there, and then I know you went to go, of course, get your 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 weapons. And, yeah, he's got something going on, unfortunately. Um, the Chotel looks like a huge sickle. Yeah, Tom, I can't wait to see it. i got to be honest. Uh, I don't know if I've seen it before, but let's hopefully he's getting back. But I'm not sure what's going on. Technology, I tell you. Huh? Never a dull moment. Ah, there we go. All right, guys. He is back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That All right. Was... We're not going to touch anything. <laughs> the, the funny thing, I was still on when you were talking. Like, I, I could hear everything you were saying. I don't know what happened. Yeah, really? That, uh, yeah, I'm just going to try to. What the How it just happened? I don't know, folks, why he's. Uh... Uh, uh, well, at least he's able to get back in quickly. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Not sure. Hmm. All right, here he is. Uh, all right. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm keeping my hands. I don't know. I'm going to make sure I'm not doing anything. So I'm putting my hands behind my back. <laughs> yeah, it's weird because I have you, I have two screens open. Like, so when, when I'm going away, I'm still on. That's yeah. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to, you know what? I'm, I don't think it's you actually more to think about. It. I wonder if it's something going on here with the platform actually. Um, yeah, but that is, that is nasty. Look at that. And so what I like about the Chotel, and so so part of what I do is because there's no manuals, um, and, and we're talking about art forms kind of dying out, right? Mm. And so the practice of some of these weapons have, like, you know, fallen by the wayside in many cases. And so what I enjoy doing, uh, what gives me peace is to be like a uh, like a forensic martial artist, you know, go through uh, okay. and um, you know reconstruct um, the the potential or possible uses of this weapon, and that that kind of for me it merges like a, a lot of my interests. So I love I love movement. Okay. I love to be physical. Um, I also love history, and I love to like research, and I love to like solve puzzles. So like and researching like how the chotel was used it involves like not just physically you know moving the blade around but in like mm. you know going through like you know accounts or looking at artwork or talking to people from these areas that may or may not remember this this practice um okay. but it's really cool though when you get a when you get a weapon like this the chotel that has this really, really unique curve, this yeah. really, really unique blade, the shape of it really speaks to, it really informs its potential, how it could potentially be used. Now, I always preface what I'm saying is to distinguish between when I'm doing a living tradition, which is something that has like a traceable lineage or mm. connection that we have access to, or something that is being reconstructed. And that's when I'm using you know, all my skills as a martial artist and all my skills as a researcher in order to come up with an educated or informed um, reconstruction of it. And that's that's 
that's um you know I, I try to be very clear when that's happening when i'm doing that but, okay brian has a question regarding what you just showed and his question is is that double-edged yes sir yes sir oh wow okay, okay. So for this that's, particular yeah. form what's really cool is because you know chotels they come in a variety of of um, curvatures right okay. and so the handle is rounded and what this allows me to do is i can index the blade because i'm getting a good example of it here hey do you have a here you know what we can do Demon? you got a bunch of blades to show yeah all right i can just lower myself i'm gonna put myself on a bomb you're gonna have the whole screen and you can just do your thing okay but, i mean I'll, I'll still be here i'm just gonna be on a bomb i'm just gonna give you the full screen as well okay yeah so like this 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 shape um, the rounded handle allows me to index the blade. So now I can use the Chotel like I would use like a saber, right? Index it now. I'm using it like I would use a sickle. And I get these, these um, hooking thrusts, right? So here it is back again, like a saber. And then here's me indexing it and using it in that way. To use the hooking, the hooking thrust, or even just like a shearing, forceful cut. Um, so it's real is, and it's it's when combined with a uh, a buckler or a shield, um, the shield takes away some of the the defensive def deficiencies that the shotel might have. So kind of behind your shield, you can start whipping those strikes around. You know, change it here is a change here now coming around, boom, boom. And then you get these really nasty backhand thrusts that you can play with as well. So it's a fun, it's a fun, deceptive, tricky blade uh, to explore. So it's probably one of my, um, I'm, I'm most known for that, I think. And it's, it's, it's definitely the one that I have the most um, fun kind of interacting with because there's so many variables that come with it. Let's see here. They they did make I did I believe they did make a Chotel in in uh, Forge and Fire, um, yeah, yeah yeah I believe that was that they did have that. I can't remember which I, I would imagine if it, it out of all the weapons that they've done um, it would be crazy that they didn't do the Chotel because it is very is a very distinctly very interesting unique uh, African weapon. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so the Kopesh. So the Kopesh and the Chotel are similar in some ways and different in a lot of ways. Uh, one, of course, the material, and two, like the um, the size difference. Uh, Kopesh are very small in comparison to um, to the Chotel. Um, the Kopesh would probably be more this closer to this length than than this, but it still has that same kind of um, that distinctive like dip that um you see in the show you see here in the show tail or even in some of the other other uh sickle swords in 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 africa which has led people to um you know speculate if the kopesh was like the if those other blades were somehow based off of the kopesh but you know don't no one can say for certain but it is interesting to discuss it so i guess He's off. Let me go and um, since I have the full screen, I'll go ahead and bring out some more weapons. Okay, here's another one of my favorites. So all these blades we've made, uh, my company uh, Street Forge Armory, my partner uh, uh, SFAJ, also known as Dashade or Jeff Jeff Johnson. So we all made these in house here. This here is uh, a Nimsha saber. This is from um, Algeria or. Um, what we call, I refer to Northwest Africa as the Maghreb, um, and uh, but particularly in Algeria. And so the earlier clip when I was doing the Mathrag, the stick fighting, this is the type of sword, one of the types of swords they would have been using the sticks to train for, right? Um, this is a really cool blade. I like playing around with this guy here. And yeah. So this right here is the Nimsha. Again, the Nimsha comes in a variety of curvatures. Uh, this is a pretty, fairly curved blade. Uh, some of them are straight. 
can be straight and some of them have like a or in between straight and curved uh there is a uh, a, a blade game called uh hellish court and one of the fighters that they have on there um was uh loosely based off of me and he uses uh, a nimsha uh similar to this here so yes do i make impact ready trainers do you mean out of steel or out of um well let me just answer the question so yes so we do we make trainers out of steel um that are used for sparring um and then we also make uh synthetic blades that we can use for for sparring and whatnot um that's kind of that's actually what we started doing first uh making synthetics and then we went and graduated into like wood aluminum and then steel grab another blade here the scabbard is not done and my partner will probably kill me from putting it online right now but um there's another saber and this blade is a manding saber it's a long blade usually the well i say uh, many of the um antique manding sabers are a little shorter but i we made this one based off of a longer blade and you'll find this in west africa um particularly uh like in mali um niger niger i don't know about niger but um any, anywhere where you find the the the, the maliki people um the remnants of old the old empire of mali uh you'll find these blades here um this is one of my favorites and um yeah we don't know much about their 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 fencing styles but it's really cool to kind of see these things come to life and so much um so much of our understanding is based off of like uh holding um and using and getting a feel for what you know antiques or what what weapons that we know may have been used in combat it again it's a it's a multiple source approach to understanding you know um a, understanding or reconstructing a martial art so getting a feel for their weapons and just kind of like you know understanding like what the uh blades potential was you know how you know like studying the edge and just seeing what kind of damage is taken it's like this stuff you know offers a lot of information so this right here is a mending saber now we typically when we think of african swords we think like super super exotic you know weird curves and all this kind of stuff but you know most you know uh, an effective and efficient shape is an efficient shape you know so going into some efficient shapes here uh, still this is a a manding style sword but with a straight blade so same culture but using a straight blade double edge and you'll find these and you know, i guess i'll i'm kind of rambling right now and then one of my all-time personal favorites And this right here is actually this is actually one of our sparring blades. It's a Takoba. It's from West Africa. It's a blade that's used by a lot of people. Uh, the Tuareg, the Fulani, uh, the Noop, the Hausa. Um, yeah, it's just a common blade. The Tuareg people made it super famous. Um, so most specimens are are um, usually say that they're they're from from the Tuareg people. But this is like one of my favorite blades here. Roughly when and where it did tree first for become the first. Let me see. Kurt has a really good question. Roughly when and where did steel first become most prevalent in African martial arts? Huh. Let's see. I want to make sure I understand your question there, Kurt. So, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, so you're asking when was steel uh, uh, become when this when was steel used in African weaponry? Um, 
That is a difficult question for me to answer. I know that iron iron ironworking is fairly early in Africa, and actually many cultures they um, okay cool. All right, make sure I'm on point with you. Uh, many cultures actually you know bypassed a, a bronze age so to speak and went directly to to working with iron um and i don't have a lot of details as to how early that was if there's anyone in the comments who has knowledge of that love to have you chime in on that um there were a few nexus points where iron rate where where sword making and iron making was was um was common uh in uh Meroe, which was in the uh, old kingdoms of uh nubia in east africa was one of those areas the mandara mountains um more recently they had a very sophisticated iron and weapon making culture there um there is one other place it is this escaping me right now um but yeah so th that's the best of my knowledge and, and there are different debates as to when iron technology entered into africa and by which route um and it's usually divided by either independent development um or it came from the east filtering through like metalway from east africa along the nile or that it entered uh via like the um that's not right for the phoenicians or it entered across the um across the um mediterranean uh via cultures like the phoenicians but i'm not 100 percent sure what where the consensus lies today um yeah hopefully that answered your question um not my best answer, but yeah. Let's see what else do we have? Yeah, yeah. Everything quiet there. Adam is part of our class. We hope to have you visit up here sometime. Yes, that would be awesome. I uh, would love to come out and, and work with you guys and um see Adam again. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge and a good guy to have. And um, hopefully one of these days I can get up there to go come and train with you guys. So good questions came in, huh? Yeah, yeah. It was like watching when I was on the bottom. Uh, roughly, yeah, good question from Kurt. And, huh. mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, those look just fat. some of the things you were showing were just fascinating. I mean, I, if you got more show, I'll, I'll duck down below. I, I wasn't just sure where you were at. Yeah, yeah, no, I I have showed the ones that I have set aside here. Um, I can always go and grab some um, some of these are the ones that are kind of like in the complete phase. Everything else would be more like they are in the process of being done. I can bring some bronze out real quick so you guys can see what a, a bronze kopesh looks like. It's not finished. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Okay. Oh, I like uh, that. <laughs> uh, I'm at least two, two questions. <laughs> Jeez, too funny. Adam is part. Uh, Justin, Adam is part of a. Uh, so Justin is Adam somebody that does these arts as well, or Let's see what he says on that. There we go. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, and this is large for a Kopesh, mind you. So, you need me to drop a low? Is it pretty big? No, it's not that large. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So you can see it's, um, oh, arm. Okay. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm sorry. That's called what again? This is a Kopesh. Okay. It's, um, uh, a blade that's closely associated with the Egyptians. It's not, it, uh, wasn't created by the Egyptians per se, but, um, it's, uh, one of those weapons that are closely associated with them. So, Okay. It's fairly large. Um, typically, they're a little a little shorter, and you can see how uh, the shape of it 
one of the theories of the creation of this weapon is that it was based off of um, these uh, slashing axes that re historians refer to as like a, a epsilon axe, it's like a crescent shaped blade. And it was supposed, you know, during a time when armor was not as was was um, I guess uh, lighter armor. We fight against lighter armored opponents. These slashing cuts were very effective. Mm. And so um, this is where the blade is supposed to get its distinctive like shapes. This here is very axe like in its in its feel. It's real heavy. This one is heavy. Wow. It shouldn't be it's definitely eight though. Cheers. And so this one, these aren't like African swords per se. These are just like straight swords, bronze blades here. Um, okay. And just kind of like to show like what you can do with the bronze. Ah, look at that. Yeah. I injured my uh, my biceps, so I can't, I don't have the same kind of strength like I used to. You can see how I can kind of bend. Oh, my, yeah, but look at that. Yeah. And so all these things come back, you know, um, when we're trying to like reconstruct like Egyptian martial arts, or you're trying to understand how bronze um, reacts under pressure, okay. you know, so we'll do stuff, we'll do tests like that, you know, what type of edge damage this takes, um, you know, of course your shield would have been like your primary, your primary uh, means of defense. Uh, but, mm. you know, like I said, this is kind of like a, a science project in a sense where you have the tools and you get to kind of experiment and see like what the weapon, what the weapon can do and what it can't do. Okay. I think it's wow, 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 wow. Most unique, uh, I can tell you that, most unique weapons I've seen. Yeah. For sure. I mean, as far as the swords and everything you were showing, I mean. Yeah. So what, Um. okay, you obviously teach this. So when you, um, as far as your teaching, are you mostly capoeira and some of these other arts? Uh, you know, is it or is it all in one umbrella, or do you have separate modules? I guess as far as it is all those things, and then a combination of those things, and then none of those things. It feels like, and so I, I, I am, um, I have, I kind of go through these fl a flux of how I structure class. Um, I have my living traditions that are kind of like our anchors, and so okay. we tend to cover those kind of like separately and regularly you know whether it's you know haitian machete colombian machete uh and goonie stick fighting um mathrag you know they're, they're kind of like they're like our our foundation most capoeira also being part of that um at the same time there is a certain amount of like crossover that happens between the classes so my i guess what i'm saying is like my class structure has changed because my circumstances have kind of changed. So um, mm -hmm. typically I'd have like those living traditions as our anchor classes that we kind of do consistently. And then some of the experimental stuff we would do like modular, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It totally makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Totally makes sense. Um, so do you, as far as your students go, I mean, not that's the most important. I'm just curious. Do you have a ranking structure? Like if they wanted to get rank and teach it or? We're working on that. I'm trying to like, and and that's the, the I think it's, it's all like this kind of this growing pains kind of thing. Yeah. To figure out. Like, it for sure. Yeah. Just trying to figure out like what the next step outside of me looks like. Um, and I think that. Um, I'm becoming okay with like, cause it, it's, I want to represent, it's like this fine line of trying to, wanting to represent something that's authentic, you know, from the, the standpoint of the culture that created it. Um, at the same time, something that is like historical, which those two things are not always the same thing. And mm -hmm. then also as a martial artist that wants to interact with other martial artists that likes to you know, punch, kick, or use weapons, sticks, whatever. Mm. Then those are then that's kind of also where I want to live. So I'm like a living, breathing martial artist, but I also want to have this connection to the history and this connection to the culture. So um I'm I'm kind of coming to terms with the idea of differentiating 
And, and JKD is good at doing that in a sense where when you are, when you're transitioning from, you know, boxing to like, you know, Wing Chun trapping to a Silat takedown to mm. a BJJ, you know, finish, right. you're kind of breaking down like where you're flowing from. And so like, yeah. I try to use that same, I try, you know, like if I was to go to a tournament um, and uh, I'm using, I'm fighting with everything that I have. And so I try to teach in a way and I try to present in a way that this is my approach based off of these yeah. historical or these cultural systems that I've learned or have exposure to. Now, again, a, you know, the, the difference with some of these artists is like, they are not, they are connected to a specific culture and a lot of times for a specific reason. Um, you take, for example, something like Dunbe Boxing, which is a boxing forum from uh, northern Nigeria. Um, it's not necessarily the go-to for like self-defense. It occurs, you know, within a particular group from that area, mm. a house of people, and it's done during a particular time period. And, um, you know, that's that. And uh, Suri Stick Fight, the same thing. Um, they don't necessarily use a stick as a means of self-defense anymore. Um, but it exists within this particular cultural ritual. Right. Okay. Now, so for me, outside coming from outside of that culture, the fine line is being able to like pay respect to the cultural reasons as to why they train it, but also, you know, my desire to interact with other people that maybe fight with long sticks, and maybe I'm using this tradition combined with another tradition so that I can interact with other people. So I, it's, it's it's always a case of trying to differentiate and be like um, clear with uh, where you're coming from and why you're coming from it from this particular angle. Okay. So I say that all to say that I'm, I am coming to terms with creating, uh, presenting what I teach as my expression based off of these systems but being able to uh, have those systems intact within my system, if that makes sense. No, you know, based on what I'm hearing from you, what I think, and it's just a suggestion, and I'm only making a suggestion based on what, you know, hearing from you and what you're sharing. Uh -huh. I think it'd be really neat if you had a ranking structure, but in addition to the physical content and them demonstrating their precision and, you know, based on the physical content, I think you should have an aspect historical content that they need to be responsible for. Uh, I think you could have a really unique ranking structure. Yeah. And again, I only base this on, you know, what you're sharing with me because I think there's such incredible historical content. I mean, you know, this is one of my most enjoyable interviews. And the reason being is I love the ones I learn stuff. You know what I mean? Like if I cover some FMA, I'm mostly doing it for the other person. And I don't mind that, but these are the ones I truly treasure because I'm learning, right. you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm working on it. I, it's been a it's 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 kind of like you when you deal with traditional arts, you get like a lot of pushback sometimes mm. uh, from like if you are you know if you are changing things, if you're innovating things, if you're not doing things in a specific way, then it's like it it is a lot of pushback that kind of happens sometimes. And I, I think that there is something to being um, creating a system that is like well organized so that it can survive after you. But that's also that's not like that's not like um ooh, what is the word? Um you want the you want the ranks and the the these positions to kind of like have a meaning. Um yeah. You know what I'm saying? So trying to find and, and then also there's like a level of fluidity and individual. Yeah, you want you don't want robots. You want some you know self creativity. Like you know, one of the things I stress in Piper when I teach my guys is like last thing is, is we want a bunch of robots. I mean, right. um, I just think you got you're in a unique position of what you're offering and the rarity of it and the historical information and content that comes along with it. I just think it's truly special what you have. I just think, you know, and I think it'd just be neat to have folks who could rank and, as you mentioned, carry it on, you know? Yeah, we're, we're definitely working on it. We're, we've, um, one of my, 
one of my longest, well, recent longest students. Um, she, she she's probably like my first, my first rank rank person. It's informal though, but you know she's been with me for about over over ten years now, and you know she's. But it, even in that, like I'm seeing like the way I present, like it's it all kind of flows together sometimes. So she has a hard time. Like, well, what are we? What is like, I know we're doing, we're doing this, 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 this type of blade, but what particular system is this coming from? And, you know, and I, I do need to come up with a curriculum so that it's like, they can, they can know what, what this information, like, yeah, where it stops. And it also will help them pass it on. Like, yeah. so when they get future students, okay, well, you know, what aspect does this come from? What system? Is this more of the Columbia influence? I, I, you know, I think that would be just beneficial for all parties involved. You know? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, and I, I'm working on that. I, I find with the machete, like I, I combine, like, um, especially like this is me just talking as like a fighter. Um, mm -hmm. I draw my influence like from Colombian machete, and I draw it from uh, Haitian machete. Um, those are my two main like short blade like systems. Okay. And uh, the the tier machete style that I that I do is uh, really is really uh, unique in that um, it is played at a very close range, and it involves like a lot of like um, like what they would say like in HEMA like binding and winding. Uh, the bind, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And so it's uh, it's a really different system than the Colombian system, which tends to be um and i think the columbian system is a more complete system in that it's like it's played from long range and close range it has um you know a lot of the hand checks and you know mm. rows and things like that and a bunch of other stuff you know it it, it has uh the use of uh stick and machete and um you know using two hands or two weapons in each hand uh, and in reverse grip. So it's a lot more, it has a lot more um, to it. Uh, so like, you know, basically I, 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 I draw from both of these systems um, when I, when I interact with people that fight with short blades or whatever else. And um, again, just being able to like say, okay, this is, this is how I put these things together. This is how, yeah. Um, this is my expression of it. Um, and then being able to say like, well, culturally, um, this is how it's done, and for this reason, mm. and then I don't know, just it's just kind of it's it's a it's a process for me, just kind of being okay with like this is how I put it together. It's based off of these things, and then being able to like cite sources as I'm, you know, presenting. I think you're in an incredible, unique position. I really do. All the people I've interviewed, 400 and something, whatever, um, I think you've got something that's rare, unique, special. Uh, I wouldn't rush it. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely do something, but, you know, ever all the vast different arts that you study, you know, uh, like almost having, you know, I know this would be somewhat work intensive, but just think of the what you would be doing as far as the future, where if you have like many manuals for each thing you did, I mean, under an umbrella of your, you know, of your system. Yeah. You know, I think that could be really neat for future generations. I mean, you would be keeping something alive as far as documentation as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're definitely in the process of it, but it's been... Yeah, but I, you know, I, I'm sure it's anything but easy. I mean, it's, yeah, you know... Um, Easy for me to say over here what you should do. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But then that, 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 that's true. Like that's the I was talking to uh, Guru Jay about that a few months ago, mm -hmm. and he was like at a point where he's like kind of laying down his curriculum as well. And we're like, hey, we should, we should, we should be curriculum buddies and kind of hold each other accountable. Yeah, you kind of motivated one another, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. Speaking of him, it looks like you got an event coming up with him so what's rooted in resistance your first year right yeah yeah first year um it's pr so i get the benefit of traveling around the country and uh doing uh hema events and then doing events for the sf sorry sfad uh the screen fighters 
Gil, I'm messing it up. Sorry, guys. Y'all, y'all can fire me. <laughs> but um, they, they do uh, stage combat and uh, fight choreography and stuff. So I get to travel to these events where you have multiple instructors, multiple arts, mm-hmm. multiple disciplines. And it's like these, you know, two, three day intensives. And so, like, I what I wanted to do is I wanted to create an event that was uh, the same, but um, it was like um, bringing together, um, and it's not specifically just African and, and Southeast Asian arts together, but since I have a very unique connection to um, Southeast Asian arts um, and uh, the African diasporic arts, it seemed like a natural, like, let's come together and let's like, let's see how these, 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 these different uh, cultures came up with similar um, methodology for dealing with like conflict. Um, circling back to the earlier question about the differences and similarities between, you know, uh, Colombian Eskrima and Filipino Eskrima, um, this would be like the place where we would like explore that and um, like in a physical sense. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 most definitely, most definitely. <laughs> so, um, I um it started off real simple. Like I have wanted to do this for a long time, but it's yeah. never really pulled the trigger on it. So my uh instructor in Haitian Machete, he's heading out. So also let's throw this out here. If anyone is very interested in traveling to Haiti to experience uh Tier Machete, uh the Afro family system, um hands-on, uh my instructor Mike Dillon, he goes, he leads a tour um every uh June or July every summer to Haiti to go train with the Avril family in Jacques Mill, Haiti. Um, he's been doing it for, you know, over uh, for the past, it's been 15 years, I believe now. So, um, yeah. So anyways, he's heading out to Haiti um, in the next, uh, heading out to Haiti in June. And so he's like, I'm passing down, I'm passing, th- you know, passing through, we can stop in Austin and do like a workshop. I was like, oh, that's that's really, really cool. And then um, I was like, I wonder if, because uh, I know that uh, Light Burley, um, who uh, does 52 Blocks, he he just recently moved to mm-hmm. which is about an hour, an hour and a half away from me. And I was like, I wonder if I can get him to like come out and, and do some stuff. And he, you know, He's his first workshop that he ever did um, was in Austin and Texas. It was with my group. And so he agreed to come out. So, oh, I said, cool. I got, I got, you know, Mike and I got light coming out. And then um, a, a, a local slot practitioner from Houston offered to come out. And then it's like, then it became like this thing. Then it just started snowballing, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and Jay and I did a, um, uh, Guru Jay and I did a uh, an exchange uh during the pandemic where he presented we presented like um parallel things so he did like okay. a, he did like a long stick i did long stick um he did a uh, sikaran and i taught uh pernata which is primarily like leg sweeping and tripping art um kind of associated with capoeira and then he did uh like pangamud you know uh empty hand. okay empty hands and i did 52 blocks to kind of just show Kind of how you know there's the they're different but they're similar in 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 some ways and so that that was probably the real kind of brainchild of like this this african diasporic and southeast asian kind of like get together fusion thing and uh yeah so i think it sounds great with me so when is it it's going to be uh june 2nd through the 4th oh, right around the corner yeah okay. it's right. it's it's right around the corner it has been a uh, uh, it has been hell i know better now uh i just want to get this first one done so if you guys are in the area if you guys want to come out please do i mean the coordination and everything yeah i tell you people just think it's i mean it's yeah, yeah man and i'm not the most organized person there is you know like i you know i'm that's not my strong suit uh yeah. but it's it's slowly coming together it's going to be a small event but i'm thankful for everyone who's already who signed up for it we're gonna have a, a tournament as well, uh, which is gonna be a mixed a mixed blade synthetics mm. uh, around the world. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is after I get through this hump, I'm gonna immediately start planning for the next one, 
um, it'll be, and I hope for it to grow into like a a, a yearly or a bi yearly, um, you know, event. Oh, I think it'll happen. I mean, I mean, you get momentum built, it starts getting known. You, you know, if good people are part of it. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. I, I think you. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Wow, wow. And uh, yeah, obviously Jay is a good guy, and and I'm sure the other guys you're speaking of are, are just as are just as good as far as you know people go. Um, yeah. So is it how many? Is it just, is it a whole weekend? Yeah, it's a whole weekend. So we're gonna do Friday night. We're gonna have a um, like a. A dinner. I'm debating. Like I'm still. This is how crazy the planning is going. I might. I might do some classes like during the early, the um, late afternoon. Yeah. And then evening time, we're gonna have like a like a like a potluck, potluck yeah. slash catered dinner orientation mixer thing. Yeah. And then Saturday is going to be classes like all day, and then a uh, tournament. On Saturday as well during the uh, morning afternoon, and then okay. Sunday will be a light day. It'll be more classes and you know some yeah. active stuff as well. So, man, that's I, don't know, I think you guys got a good thing in the mix coming. You know, I think there's I think we need more stuff like this. Yeah, you know, um, we got right now. Oh, boy, good to see you guys at the beat the crap out of cancer. You know, Dean hosts that event. Oh, so do you go to beat the crap out of cancer? event no i don't think I, um i should though. yeah be good to see yeah i think you should um i'm not now with regards to texas i don't know if there's one even well i'm gonna say no to that i don't think there's one going on however though um you know what you're doing and all that would fit really well into this very uh incredibly like-minded people it's uh based on dog brothers ethos um you know but uh yeah uh, uh oh so we got a question here from brian he'd like to know you're kind of the tournament format okay. all right so the uh tournament is is i'm following a format that's laid out by arena uh, weapon arts which is a and not a hema group but they do they do um they would call themselves as a mixed weapons martial arts. Um, so they have a, and I, I have the uh, the guidelines and the the required gear um, uh, via PDF on a PDF. Uh, basically, it's what, what we're trying to promote is like um, uh, clean fencing uh, mm. with with the understanding that we're using edge weapons. So um, we're trying again. The 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 awareness of of um, the understanding of, of of blade arts is being able to hit and not being hit, uh, minimizing your damage, um, as as opposed. So that's kind of the the idea behind the rule set. Uh, we have the. I mean, it's pretty straightforward as far as like. So point system then? it is a point system um there is minimum like there are there's no grappling in a sense that you can you can trap and gain position over a person but we're trying to limit like you know throws and takedowns on going on the ground and the whole ground and pound yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Was, like, nothing like that um and I'm not sure if he's covered in his rule set uh, anything that has to do with like punching and kicking and stuff, but it's mostly yeah. uh, blade blade focused, um, mm. trying to like hit and not get hit, uh, minimizing damage, uh, fighting in a way that's like uh, keeps both you and your your partner uh, alive in a sense without any serious injuries. Um, yeah. What else? We're doing light gear as far as like what as far as like what they do in HEMA. So basically, uh, throw protection, uh, mask, uh, hands, and probably groin cup. That stuff is is probably required. Um, let me see what else. If there's anything else I could think of, yeah, that's that's the the gist of it. 
That sounds pretty exciting. You get different systems in there using it, um, edge awareness and base and basing the rules on that so you don't have a bunch of double kills or yeah not. yeah trying yeah. to trying to avoid that as much as possible oh and it's yeah. also the range of weapons is um there are no spears but um the minimum length for blade is 20 inches and the maximum length length is 36 inches so it should so be 20 20 to 36 okay yeah so it should be kind of interesting to see yeah yeah and uh wow that does sound um you guys will be taking some uh, footage, videos, and yeah, sure. most definitely, most definitely. Yeah, if you guys do, man, I mean, please, please, you know, uh, put them in a group. I think folks would love to see that. Most uh, definitely. Yeah. So, um, you kind of already touched on your future goals. I mean, and all that. As far as you, you want to get a ranking system. Obviously, you want to spread your arts. Yeah. Uh, you want to work with like-minded folks and the tournament and, and there. Um, what do you? Uh, how can the uh, if folks want to uh, you teach online how can folks get a hold of you if they want to pursue what you're teaching yeah yeah Be before i answer that can i i'm going to circle back to those goals w one more thing i like to kind of oh, yeah please do sure one more thing i wanted to just kind of add to that is yeah. um one of my goals is i i see it as like to establish a connection with uh practitioners that are that are maintaining and that are at the forefront of maintaining their 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 cultural arts their their living traditions creating a space and a platform to like for you know for us to travel and to train there and a platform for them to travel to us and come and train here and having that kind of bridge and exchange um is something i would like to see uh, more of in the future um Amen. Yeah. So that's yeah, I totally agree. Regardless of the arts and, and all that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. I, I just, I just think it benefits everybody. You know. Well, definitely. Uh, you know, just you know, bridging. You know. Bridging. Um, so, so do you teach? So, I mean, I with the pandemic. I mean, looks like we're out of it. Obviously. Yeah. And uh, we stay that way. So, uh, were you doing online lessons? And, and do you do online lessons? I do. I do. Mm -hmm. um, yes to both of those. I um, I I pivoted to online. It was uh, it was definitely uh, 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 different. And yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so yeah. I I once things kind of opened up a little bit. Uh, we resumed our online classes. Mm. And so now it's like um, it, that kind of comes, it, it comes with, to, in order to be able to continue to do that, you have to have like, uh, you know, access to Wi-Fi and the place has to be yeah. you know, fairly well lit. So we've, uh, we went through a roller coaster ride over the past, like, um, ooh, the past, the past, two years especially this last year where we we raised money we got a studio space we lost that studio space and you know we um, found another studio space that we were leasing and it was just kind of like you know up and down and not having many students and it just made it really difficult to kind of like have like a consistent like here's class this is what we're meeting this is what we're doing uh um, just recently we started um, holding classes at the African American uh, Heritage Center here in Austin, Texas, and uh, that's looking like it's providing me with the the stable facility and a and a, a much better environment for presenting uh, online classes and even just like in person classes. So, fantastic. Um, that's been a and that's been like a I, I just taught my first week like last week there, so it's been no, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so good change. What's the best way folks get a hold of you? Facebook Messenger? You can Facebook message me. Um, I have a YouTube channel under my name. Uh, you can check out the Hama uh, the Hama uh, Association at uh, Hama and uh, Hama uh, WordPress. Uh, we also have a Hama YouTube channel as well and Instagram, and then my name, my Instagram as well, Demon Stith. Um, yeah, it's pretty easy to find. I found your YouTube easy enough. So yeah. yeah. Um, let me see here. We got a little question for Kurt. Uh, what makes you happiest about the future of martial arts? Um, 
I love the idea of being able, I like, I, I love being able to like uh, learn and expand my knowledge and have exposure mm. to, um, to, to different ideas. And I think that we're in this unique position now where we're more open, there's more exchange. Um, and I, Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm loving that idea. Like, I, I think that, you know, we, we talk about like traditional arts and we talk about the idea of like purity of arts. And then, um, you know, we see that these, some of these arts that we say are like traditional arts, that they're pure arts, you know, well, actually they, they are combinations of a couple of things and that, you know that that were created and you know so i i think that we're coming that 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 taboo is um we're losing that taboo in a sense and that we're 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 talking more and exploring more and i, I love to see more of that yeah i think it's going to happen and i think for a few reasons one i think uh one that one of the good things that came out of covid was uh folks you know obviously incorporating zoom you know into their teaching and then, you know, I saw it, I saw the evolution right after my discussion. I mean, like, you know, these cross pollination, you know, guys taking Zoom classes that normally would never, you know, would on a different system, FMA system or what have you. And I'm seeing that spread over, into, you know, what we did with just last week, I did with Piper and 52. I think it's just going to keep growing. I think people are seeing this and I think they're getting so much enjoyment out of it being exposed to different arts and people uh, i don't see it going away mm -hmm. i think it's just going to grow and grow i think so yeah yeah but uh we just we miss any questions and we didn't well hey this has been i mean this has been absolutely wonderful i, I appreciate you coming on again i just love Thank interviews you. that you know what i'm learning and i thought some of the history you were bringing up towards the beginning of the show was just incredible you know, regarding, you know, what they were doing and how they were bringing, you know, their experience and tactics and all that over. I just, that was, I don't know, that was just fascinating information. Um, and they're, what is this, Dean, right? the trend center? <laughs> <laughs> I hardly, uh, I doubt that. Uh, yeah, trend center. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, again, I, I want to appreciate you coming on and there. Um, and yeah hopefully this is the last we uh, you know see you again or i mean i would love to touch base and get you back on after you guys do that with jay i'm, I'm dying to see you know, the vids that are going to come out of there i hope you guys you know can yeah. post some in the group you know i think folks would enjoy that most definitely most definitely yeah but uh but i wish you the best on that event i mean it sounds like you've got some great people that you're working with so i'm sure it's gonna be a success and who knows like you were mentioning maybe it'll grow to a bi-yearly thing you know yeah uh, most definitely yeah but uh hey well you take care of yourself thanks again Damon. all right thank you you take care appreciate you guys thanks for all the wonderful questions all right sir salute salute And that wraps up 409. Almost lost track. Uh, who is next? Who is next? Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, X <laughs> uh, <we're> gonna <laughs> look at episode 355. Um, yeah, that would definitely, I mean, that episode 355, I think, is going to help them more just organizing events. Uh, I mean, just overall, just life lessons, uh, folks. If you've not watched episode 55, you're you're missing out. Um, anyway, getting back to who's next, I think I have Duhan Belton this Friday morning. I just got to confirm with him. Uh, he's been traveling to Thailand, doing all sorts of things. So yeah, I think that's pretty much a definite. This weekend, I know. Google Tom is interviewing Rebecca Kane, and I got a couple folks. Yeah, so but you'll you'll see him pinned on there. But yeah, look for two on Belton Friday. I'm pretty sure. Um, I think that's the next one. I'm pretty sure, and could be one Wednesday. I'm not sure, but uh, I know pretty sure two on Belton uh, Friday morning. 
or midday or something like that. But at any rate, thank you all that watched, commented, and submitted questions. Uh, this was this was so this one was so interesting, so uh, information packed, historically speaking. All right, guys, when are the Finland guys on? Hey, whenever you want them on, throw me some names. Uh, I'd be more than happy to get Finland uh, guys on or Tom since he's closer, but either or, yeah, let me know. Definitely. Yeah, that would be fun getting those guys on. Um, where, and uh, <laughs> yes, 355. Right here, guys. Here it is. Episode 355. <laughs> many valuable life lessons in that episode. <laughs> Too many to count. All right, folks. I will see you next time.